Okay, so in this quick video here, we're going to go over the ecological levels of organization. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so let's go ahead and start with the most basic level of ecological organization, which is called a population. You know, in the picture, we have a bunch of rabbits here, and this would be an example of a population. It's a group of the same species, all living in the same area. And so what have we learned? Well, we've learned that populations have a limit. You know, you may have heard the expression that rabbits can reproduce like rabbits. They make more, they reproduce at an abundant rate. But there's what we've seen is that nature limits the amount of reproduction that can occur. What we've seen is that environments typically have, or populations typically have a carrying capacity. It's the greatest number of individuals that the environment can sustain there are limiting factors. There are factors that prevent the overpopulation of rabbits. You know, for instance, there's a lack of resources. Eventually, there's just not enough food for all the rabbits to survive. This can lead to competition, competition for food, for water, for mates, for living spaces. And as populations get larger and larger and larger, more individuals brings more disease. And let's not forget that wherever rabbits live, there's probably predators that are trying to eat the rabbits. And so uh, for that reason, populations have a limit. They have a, what we call a carrying capacity. Well, let's zoom out to the next level of ecological organization. When we zoom out a little bit, we come to a level called the community. And th these, this level is defined as an area where there are many populations living. So not just rabbits, also plant life like grasses, plant life such as trees, birds m may be nesting in these trees, and lurking in the shadows may be some predators symbolized by my wolves. So this is more realistic of a community. And, and so what have we learned by studying communities? Well. We've learned that each uh, species and individual has its own habitat. You know, the birds are nesting in the trees, the rabbits are digging through the ground, burrowing and, and building their homes. And we also learned that organisms have their own niche. A niche is like a role or a lifestyle that the organism occupies. For instance, the wolves are predators, you know, that's their niche. Uh, and then you have the rabbits are herbivores and other animals that are not pictured here could be omnivores and other forms of life that are not pictured here could be decomposers. You know, one reason why you can have two species of birds living in the same trees is because they have a different niche. The bluebirds, for instance, may build their nest in the autumn months and eat insect A. The reddish pinkish birds, however, might build their nest in the spring and eat insect B. Because they're not in direct competition with another, one another, they're able to coexist. Their niches do not overlap with one another. If their niches were to overlap, you would see competition. Zoom out, we come to our next level called the ecosystem. And th what's different with the ecosystem? What are we adding? Well, we're adding the living and the non-living factors in this environment. So right now we have a community because all the organisms pictured are living. But in an ecosystem, let's say we add some non-living rocks, we add some non-living water, now we have an ecosystem. And so what have we learned by studying ecosystems? What we've learned is that the biotic life is affected by the abiotic, which that simply means that life is affected by non-living factors. You know, for instance, drought, if there's a time period of extreme drought, well, this could re reduce the ability for plants to grow. Another example uh, of would be, for instance, the rocks release phosphorus, which is part of the phosphorus cycle. And so rocks which are non-living, release phosphorus into the soil, and once phosphorus is in the soil, plants can grow, and uh, you have it part of a healthy ecosystem. Well, we've also learned that it goes the other way, too, is that the non-living parts of the environment are affected by the living, so the abiotic is affected by the biotic. Great examples of this would be, you know, humans and our polluting of waterways. You know, humans, we're a living organism and we pollute non-living waterways. Another example would be, decompo a positive example right here would be decomposers, living decomposers, like bacteria and fungus. Living decomposers, they enrich the soil with nutrients. Soil's not living. 
And so these are great examples of how the abiotic factors are affected by the biotic factors. Well, let's zoom out to the next level of ecology. When we zoom out to the next level of ecology, we come to a biome. A biome is a large area of land with a distinct climate, plant life, and animal life. You know, and so what have we learned by studying biomes? Well, we've learned that the climate of an area determines where life can survive. You know, the, the biome that you see here that includes northern United States and Canada is the biome called the taiga. You know, the taiga is characterized by a lack of water during the long, cold winter months. You know, this prevents broadleaf trees and plants from growing in the taiga. You also see very few, if any, cold-blooded animals. You don't really see a lot of snakes and you don't really see a lot of salamanders. Cold-blooded organisms have a really hard time living in these environments. Another biome pictured right here is even further north. This would be the tundra. And again, the tundra is characterized by even colder and drier conditions. And this prevents much of any kind of life from living in the tundra. Yeah, you'll see scattered uh, plants and scattered animals. But for the most part, the tundra is a very, uh, uh, life is very rare in the tundra. When we zoom out, we come to the final level of ecology called the biosphere. This is the part of the Earth where we can find life. You know, the picture here are all the biomes of the Earth, the deserts and the tundras and the taigas and the tropical rainforests. You know, all the biomes combined make up our biosphere. And it stretches from the depths of the ocean to about 11 miles, 10, 11 miles up into the atmosphere. Above that, we don't really see any life. And so what have we learned by studying the biosphere? We've learned that changes to the biosphere can affect life. One of the best examples of this is what we see with pollution and human action. You know, for uh, the past few centuries, humans, if we look at this picture of the Earth here, have been putting out a whole bunch of extra amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and we're seeing some global effects of this. We're seeing temperatures and climate patterns altered around the entire Earth. Great example of how the biosphere can be affected by life. Okay, I'd like to leave you with this picture here of this pyramid to kind of sum up what we've talked about. You know, a population is a group of one species and that fits inside of a community, which are many species. Communities fit inside of ecosystems and many ecosystems fit inside of a biome and there's several dozen biomes that fit inside of the biosphere. So these are the levels of ecological organization. You know, post your comments and thoughts in the space below. Perhaps I'll get a chance to respond to some of them. Thanks for watching.